when we talked about batteries, most of these, many of these are now where you have prototypes, they are commercial. We want to look at an early stage calculation and how uh, the energy analysis can be used to actually compare between different options. So we talked about hydrogen and the only way we can think in terms of making hydrogen uh, viable is if we can make it from renewable sources. So current methods of hydrogen production, typically most of it, 90 percent of hydrogen production comes from natural gas, from steam methane reforming. One can also have coal gasification and electrolysis. Mostly it is based on fossil fuels which is not sustainable from the overall viewpoint. So we need to look at hydrogen production from renewable energy sources like wind, solar, biomass. And this study that we are going to talk to you about is to look at biological methods of hydrogen production. These are still at the laboratory scale and the where you can operate at ambient temperatures and pressures. They are expected to be less energy intensive and they have a variety of feedstocks as carbon source like sugars, lignocellulosic material, wastewater and there are several reactions, there are substrates and bacteria. So you have basically the biological feedstock, something like C6H12O6 uh, with water giving you hydrogen, CO2 and then uh, another compound. Mm -hmm. So this is the hydrogen that we would separate and use and we would like to, this you can see this is a slightly old paper, it is in uh, 2008, with a comparison of biohydrogen production processes. So what we said is, all these processes today are still at the laboratory scale. Based on what has been done in the laboratory scale uh, and the performance, can we assess and see whether these are likely to be viable and how do they compare from an energy or a net energy point of view. So we would like to calculate the NER and see if those NERs are greater than 1. And in order to do that, so the production at commercial level not reported, pretreatment methods and hydrogen production depends on the feedstock, which feedstock is viable, which is not, which process is viable, which is not. So the analysis of different feedstocks and processes is necessary before we invest in scaling up the process. And this is a methodology that we have used. We have shown, we are looking at biomass to hydrogen, there are thermochemical methods, pyrolysis and gasification, larger scale. We are here, we are looking at biological processes, biophotolysis, dark fermentation, photofermentation. I am not going to go into the details of the process, I am just going to illustrate for you the methodology and some of the results and those who are interested can look at the paper and associated papers. And this can be an area where still this is an area where there is a scope for doing active research. So we look at <coughs> four different processes, dark fermentation, photofermentation, two-stage fermentation, biocatalyzed electrolysis and we will take an input feedstock of sugarcane juice. Uh, so the functional unit that we have defined is 1 kg of hydrogen to be produced at 25 degrees centigrade temperature and 1 atmosphere pressure. We compare this with a base case of steam methane reforming with natural gas. And we would like to calculate one, two couple of things. One is what is the net energy ratio output by the non-renewable energy input, the NER should be greater than 1. Also what is the kg of CO2 equivalent per kg of hydrogen and then the energy efficiency. We have used the LCI software SEMA Pro, but we can also do this um, just using our own calculations. And uh, the uh, heat which is uh, being used in the processing, we need to produce steam. We used uh, diesel with 90 percent combustion efficiency. For the electricity, we use the Indian electricity mix and uh, this is the kind of mix and uh, we said that uh, biomass derived CO2 is 100 percent carbon closure, so zero uh, CO2 impact and we look at natural gas and biogas as the rest uh, residue. This is the electricity supply mix that has been assumed in this case. Um, there are different kinds of, uh, for steam methane reforming as the base case, we use natural gas, coal and these are all the different kinds of inputs which are used for the net energy analysis of hydrogen from steam methane reforming, which is used as a base case for comparison with these options. And uh, this uh, one was the dark fermentation. In the case of photofermentation, we have the sugarcane mill to get bagasse 
Then we get photofermentation which goes to the anaerobic digester to produce methane and the photofermentation output is uh, separated using pressure swing adsorption and use to, so we get hydrogen. In each of these processes there is some energy input which we quantify. In the third process that we have is the two stage fermentation process where again we have milling and bagasse, we have dark fermentation as well as photo fermentation and then you have the anaerobic digester for methane and pressure swing adsorption for hydrogen. Uh, in the next process is with biocatalyzed electrolysis where we have an anode and a cathode and bacteria where you have this power as small, uh, this is where you have the electrolysis and hydrogen is being produced. And uh, these are the input data um, in terms of the electricity used in the sugarcane crush, crushing, uh, the um, production in the dark fermentation, photo fermentation, methane to CO2 ratio, the recovery in the PSA. Compressor needs F, um, uh, electricity input, so we have the isothermal efficiency and then we have the loading of the biocatalyzed electrolysis. Based on this, we build up for each of the process mass and energy balances. I am not going to go into details of this, you can look at the details in the paper and essentially what happens is that for each of these, the sugarcane input, electricity input the ammonia, platinum, the outputs which are there and for each of these processes we create the inventories in terms of masses and then we also create the energy content. And then <coughs> the, in the case 1, the final results without byproduct, with byproduct of course it looks much better. You can see that in all these cases the CO2 uh, emissions kg CO2 per uh, kg of hydrogen that we have is significantly lower in all the bio uh, in the bio hydrogen processes and it turns out that the two stage process seems to be the best in terms of the um, uh, CO2 emissions. <coughs> Similarly, if you look at the non-renewable energy use, uh, photo fermentation and two stage process look to be similar, uh, while biocatalyzed electrolysis uh, uses much more in terms of the energy. Uh, so this gives us a way, uh, a direction uh, in terms of how to move forward in terms of processes. Within the process, we can again use it if we can have a process model and we can use it to make the comparison um, between making a viable process and making a process which can then go to the next stage where you can do the economics. Uh, this uh, has been, this is, these are a series of charts which have been used uh, by Ashby, which has been proposed by a, a UK researcher Ashby and this is reported in Alvo et al. Um, you can see essentially the idea is that when we choose materials, we often do that based on a particular application we choose from a particular set of materials. And uh, people often historically use a particular set of materials, but for some properties it is possible to have a whole host of materials. So for instance, if you look at ceramics, metals, polymers, and we look at, let us say the property that we are interested in is a Young's modulus. So you can have for a given Young's modulus a whole set of different materials between metals and ceramics. And different materials have different amounts of embodied energy. Similarly, we can also draw this in terms of embodied CO2. So, we can actually choose a material that uses less energy or less GHG equivalent emissions and this could be a basis for looking at sustainable design for the future. And this is just to illustrate, this is another parameter when we look at strength. And so, one can actually create these kind of curves and can, these can aid the designer in terms of choice of different kinds of materials. And we are now in, a, in an era where we actually uh, have nanotechnology and we are creating designer materials. So, this can be uh, e even more useful because we can actually uh, look at materials with a particular capability which has a low uh, energy uh, footprint, low carbon footprint. Uh, so, with this, I would like to just give you the last example uh, where we are talking about the sustainability analysis where we are looking at 
combining all of this the LCA, the thermodynamic analysis, technology, uh, technoeconomic analysis, we would like to screen different kinds of technologies and compare them and see what are the prospects for uh, future and this can help us in decision on investment. So, we have looked at in the case of life cycle assessment these two criteria we will look at the cumulative energy demand and the carbon emission footprint. And in thermodynamic analysis we can look at the energy efficiency, the exergy efficiency, exergy is basically the second law of um, using the second law where we convert everything into work equivalent which is exergy. Um, and then we can look at the primary energy consumption per kg. We can look at the current costs, future costs and bottom up costs. So, we will take an example. This is from a um, PhD thesis done recently by one of our students where we looked at the possibility of using for zinc which we manufacture uh, currently uh, using an industrial process using fossil fuels how can we make the zinc manufacture process sustainable. So, we have a whole host of different options uh, where we make it uh, zero carbon and we would like to compare this. So, one of the processes that we are looking at is a solar carbothermal re reduction where we start with zinc oxide and a carbon source which could be biomass or coal. We have this reaction which is essentially zinc oxide plus carbon giving us zinc plus CO. And <coughs> this is a carbothermal reaction which we are carrying out at uh, high temperatures. Uh, we generate those temperatures by uh, getting uh, solar thermal concentrated heat and this uh, there has been this reactor which has been there for carbothermal reaction of zinc a 300 kilowatt reactor compound parabolic collectors and this has been done in uh, Israel. You can see here that on the ground the, you have these uh, heliostats which are focusing onto a reactor and uh, this is a beam down reactor which again focuses uh, these this uh, translates it to a mirror and this goes to a reactor which is here and uh, this is getting very high temperatures and you can have you can concentrate it. This is a one reactor which has actually been built and the, some performance data is available. We took that performance data and tried to analyze what does this process mean if we wanted to implement this process to manufacture zinc, how would it look like in terms of the energy and the carbon. And uh, this is how we calculate this. So, essentially what happens is you can look at the multiplicity of processes. Uh, we can have either keep the process as it is zinc oxide leaching electrovining to zinc metal and we can uh, look at uh, creating these the electricity that we are using and the heat that we are using get it from renewables that means in photovoltaics or CSP. So, there is one possibility which with the baseline example is grid hydrometallurgy where you get grid electricity or we could have the uh, um, solar giving you PV electricity and then running um, in, uh, the PV hydrometallurgy or we can have uh, solar thermal CSP, CSP hydrometallurgy and get zinc and carbon monoxide or we can do the carbothermal, the thermochemical and the whole host of different uh, routes. In each of these we then identified and designed the reactors and the systems to produce a certain amount of zinc annually and then made this comparison and I am going to show you <coughs> just the final uh, results. Uh, when we did this we then calculated, we could, uh, developed a sort of Sankey or an energy balance diagram which shows you the different kinds of where all are the energy flows and the overall kinds of losses and, and the final uh, output. Uh, so, based on this we can see that 
the energy efficiency as compared um, the uh, solar carbothermal and grid power when we look at solar carbothermal and the PV for the auxiliary load we can have an option of PV, CSP and grid hydro metallurgy. Uh, so, you can see that PV and hydro um, the uh, at the pilot scale if we one looks at it the uh, um, PV and hydro metallurgy um, the existing process and making it PV seems to be um, better in terms of an energy efficiency uh, viewpoint. And however, from a CO2 viewpoint when we look at the life cycle assessment uh, from the cumulative energy demand CED and the CEF you can see very clearly that uh, with grid electricity, this is the mega joules per kg of zinc that we are getting and uh, with PV um, we can it, this reduces very significantly and CSP uh, also this reduces if we can get uh, the thermochemical route with biomass then we can actually get somewhat nearer the PV though it is it's still a, a little uh, higher than the PV. However, on a CO2 basis you can see very clearly that if we compare a thermochemical process with biomass, thermochemical process with biomass then it is possible to actually go ahead and uh, make the thermochemical process uh, with the PV auxiliary for the auxiliary and the thermochemical process. Uh, turns out to be uh, better than the PV hydrometallurgy option. So, this shows us that it is possible to actually go ahead and we can look at a new renewable based process for zinc and it is possible actually that we can modify all the industrial processes so that they become zero carbon. Uh, there are a, a multiplicity of different uh, possibilities in terms of routes and uh, when we do the initial uh, pilots and the experiments uh, one can actually um, use net energy and life cycle analysis and the carbon uh, footprint uh, as a basis for making this comparison. Now, what does it look like in terms of economics? Now, interestingly of course, when we look at in the economics these all these routes that we talk of are much costlier today. They are costlier by a factor of 10, but it is possible with uh, technology development and volumes that these costs we can go down significantly in the future. And so, for instance, if we look at it, um, the um, solar carbothermal with biomass, which is the route that we are looking at, is um, depending on the way you do the estimates about a thousand to two thousand dollars per ton as compared to the grid hydrometallurgy commercial one which is uh, <coughs> of the order of three hundred dollars per ton. Of course, this is at the pilot scale if we uh, make this at the commercial scale and we expect the kind of uh, cost reductions that are possible uh, then we can actually uh, go ahead and get in that same uh, range. So, it is possible that we can uh, do uh, this kind of uh, 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 cost reductions. Uh, so, now when you look at net energy analysis, life cycle analysis, life cycle analysis gives us a way in which we can uh, look at over the entire life cycle the environmental impacts and the energy impacts net energy analysis at times what happens is especially in the case of new technologies and when we are looking at uh, going from the research and the lab scale to the pilot scale or pilot scale to the before commercialization it is very difficult to estimate what would be the cost. In a situation where you have uh, limited information about the costs and there are only one or two companies which are exploring this, it is important to look at how does a new technology look at from the point of view of the overall energy that is input, is the NER greater than 1, 
what does it look like in terms of the CO2 impact. So, these are additional tools and techniques available to you which you can use along with the economic calculation and the emission calculations and that can help in sort of screening and deciding where it can go. In some cases, if you find that the ratios, the energy uh, numbers and the cost numbers are almost similar, then it is likely that there is no, not much scope for uh, reduction or it needs uh, major breakthroughs. In the cases where you find that the uh, energy inputs are much lower, but the costs are at a higher factor, it means that with technology development and uh, commercialization, it is possible that that technology may uh, actually yield better results. So, an energy, net energy analysis can uh, help and direct uh, some of the choices of new materials, new processes and this is something which has been used, but not used as much as it could be and this is something which I hope you will use when you uh, analyze different energy systems and you especially look at new things coming out uh, to see that they are viable from an overall energy point of view. With this, we will close with this module and we will go to the next module which will be on uh, energy policies and uh, how we can do policy analysis. Music